Hello and welcome to the video. Today we'll be going over The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson, turning simple disciplines into massive success and happiness. And to me this book is really all about goal achievement. Not necessarily goal setting, but the actual actions that you need to do in order to achieve the goals that you have. And I think through reading this book you'll notice quite a few things about how you go about attaining your goals. And if you're the type of person who has set goals in the past and hasn't been able to achieve them, this book is perfect for you. But before I dive too deeply into the book, let's talk about its author, Jeff Olson. You might be wondering who is the guy that wrote The Slight Edge, or who is Jeff Olson? I know I was before I started reading. Turns out that he's a keynote speaker to thousands of people all around the world, and he's helped hundreds of thousands of people achieve financial freedom and personal excellence. This is also through this book, which is a very popular book. If you look up any uh, book lists on, for example, goal achievement or even just goal setting, uh, habits, and etc., Jeff's book is almost always near the top of the list because it really is that good, and because of that, it has a very wide readership. Jeff's also self-described as a perpetual student of personal development, and I think what you'll find throughout the book is that he has borrowed a lot of different techniques from some of the greats out there, which, of course, is just a great way to write a book if you can kind of meld together in your own philosophy all the different great teachings from the great teachers. You can find more about Jeff at theslightedge.org. And with that all out of the way, let's get into the actual meat of the book. The first quote that I pulled out from this book is that that's the only reason our lives follow that roller coaster. It's that simple. As soon as we get away from failure and up past the line of survival, we quit doing the things that got us there. Now that quote's very interesting. How many of us have risen from some type of failure? Like, let's say for whatever reason we were uh, out of shape or overweight or etc. How many of us have lost that first five or ten pounds but then quit doing the things that got us to that point? And because of that we ended up failing and we got on this roller coaster of losing the weight and then starting again and losing the weight and gaining it and starting again and starting this roller coaster. That's essentially what he's talking about in this quote, and that's essentially what the slight edge is going to help you overcome. He continues the quote and he says, you know what that means. It means that you already know how to do everything that it takes to make you an outrageous success. If you can make that first step towards success and rise up from the failure, you know what you need to do in order to get that full level of success that you desire. He says that that's how you've survived up until this point. And if you can survive, then you can succeed. I love that sentence. If you can survive, you can succeed. You don't need to be some brilliant, impossible thing. You don't need to learn some insanely difficult skills or have some genius level brainstorm of an innovative idea. All you have to do is keep doing the things that got you this far. All you have to do is keep doing the things that got you this far. And so many of us fall off the wagon, so to speak, halfway through the process or even you know, a tenth of the way through the process. He goes on to say, he says, which is exactly what 99.9% .9 of people don't do. What those things are? why most people don't do them, and how you can live an outrageously happy and successful life by doing them is what this book is all about. So you can see that this book is exactly what you might need if you weren't able to achieve goals in the past or if you just want a more compelling framework on how to achieve them in the future. He's going to tell us exactly what th what the things are. We're going to go over why most people don't do them and then how you can do them and live that outrageously happy and successful life because of them. So, as I said a little bit in the beginning, Jeff is a perpetual student of personal development. And because of that, this book really echoes quite a lot of great personal development material. For example, the compound effect. The compound effect and the slight edge are essentially the same principle. And Atomic Habits uses the same principle as well, this 1% improvement every day. And of course, Think and Grow Rich, the classic. Almost every personal development book has borrowed at least something from Think and Grow Rich. And that's some pretty important company for Jeff, and I think it's definitely warranted. Uh, Jeff definitely deserves a spot on the list of very important company himself, and this book does as well. But because he's taking some of these great concepts and distilling them into an amazing principle of the slight edge, I think that this book is definitely worth the read. Because even though you may have heard some of these ideas before, Jeff's writing style really puts it into perspective well. The principles in the slight edge will help you become more successful. And the more ways you can hear those principles, the better. I totally am a believer in that. The more ways that you can hear a certain principle, the better. Because your mind will be able to create more frameworks 
around that and see it in more of the things that you do. And because of that, I recommend that you pick up the book as it's sure to become a classic. It will be on the best sellers list for years and years to come, and I'm sure it will be on the top goal setting book list for years and years to come. Plus, of course, you can check Jeff's uh, stuff out online, his different talks, and all of the different stuff at theslightedge.org. And now we'll get into the first point that I pulled out of the book. I want to talk about what is it? What is the slight edge? The quote that I pulled out says, The things that you take that take you out of failure and up towards survival and success are simple. So simple, in fact, that it's easy to overlook them. Extremely easy to overlook them. And isn't that just the truth? Some of the things that lead people towards success are way simpler than you might think. In fact, the human brain really wants to create this amazing imaginative path towards success that you might have to take and all the obstacles that you will have to overcome and all the heroic feats of willpower that you'll have to exert. And as Jeff says here in this quote, it simply isn't the case. These things are very, very simple to do. It's just easy to overlook the, overlook them because when you look at them, they seem insignificant. Those small things seem very insignificant. They're not big, sweeping things that take a huge effort. They're not heroic or dramatic. Mostly, they're just little things that you do every day that nobody else even notices. They're things that are so simple to do, yet successful people actually do them, and obviously while unsuccessful people only look at them and don't take action. So again, they're very, very simple to do, and they're things that you don't even notice. So a lot of the successful people out there are doing tiny things in their day that are making them successful that you don't even notice. All you see is the end result. He says things like saving a few dollars out of a paycheck or put and putting it into savings and leaving it there, and leaving it there, I like that point as well. Um, or doing a few minutes of exercise every day and not skipping it, right? Consistency. Or reading 10 pages of an inspiring, educational, life-changing book every single day. Or watching one of these videos. Or taking a moment to tell someone how much you appreciate them and doing that consistently every day for months and years. Little things that seem insignificant in the doing, yet when compounded over time yield very big results. And I think the important thing about the little things is that they are just little things. They You don't have to exert that much willpower in order to do them. So you can save all of your willpower for consistently doing them, right? Two different ways to use your willpower, all at once or over the long haul. Over the long haul, compounded over time, yields very big results. He says that you could call these little virtues or success habits. I call them simple daily disciplines. Simple, productive actions repeated consistently over time that in a nutshell is the slight edge so that is exactly what the slight edge is it's essentially doing those small little things that seem insignificant over time and it compounds and becomes a very big part of your success so we'll talk a little bit more about the slight edge here it's about doing those little things that seem insignificant uh, consistently over time like he says in that quote and have we heard this before of course we have we heard it in the compound effect which I'll leave a link to that video in the comments down below and then also in James Clear's book which this graph is actually from this 1% better every day concept that James Clear has if you get 1% better every single day you can not see very much change in the beginning just by doing those simple things that Jeff Olson is talking about you're gonna see not very much change in the beginning but again, slowly over time, through the power of compounding, you're going to get better and better and better. And then also, there's the reverse effect of that as well. If you don't take action towards those small things that you should be doing every single day, and instead you do maybe negative habits every single day, you are going to pretty quickly go downhill and essentially get to zero. So really, this light edge is all about managing this graph. It's about continually trying to choose the things that are going to make you successful those small things to do every single day and then being consistent with them and that's exactly what we need when we're talking about the slight edge that's exactly what we need when we're talking about goal achievement is this commitment to consistency and I really love the name the slight edge because it really inspires that commitment to consistency right every single day I'm gonna get a slight edge on my competitors on my previous self and it really inspires that commitment to consistency because it's not trying to take any grand actions in, in the day, but it's just that slight little bit better than you were the day before or than your competition is probably willing to be, however you choose to view it. So doing the small things daily 
that will give you a slight edge over time will give you a gigantic edge eventually. And we can see that in this uh, exponential or in this compounded graph here, right? Slowly but surely, we're getting better and better and better until, you know, a few months in, we're not that much better than the competition, but we're slightly better than the competition. But years later, we are so far ahead of the competition that if we continue on this trajectory, they have no hope of possibly catching up. And also, if you can think about the competition as your previous self, you can see that eventually when you get up to here, it's going to take a very long time for you to decline back to normal or back to your maintenance mode, I would say. So think about these questions when you think about the commitment to consistency that you're going to have to make to achieve your goals. Are you willing to make this commitment to consistency, right? So many experts are talking about it, and it's obviously worth it for you to make this commitment, but you really need to ask yourself first, are you willing to make this commitment? Because it is a commitment, and as commitments do, they require a lot of work. They require some willpower over a long period of time. And you could think about this if you're thinking, oh, I'm committed to consistency. Okay, well, how have you committed already? What places in your life have you committed to being consistently taking those small actions towards your success? And what spots in your life have you not committed? And how can you make a small commitment there towards success? And then also, what can you do to reaffirm your commitments? So if you're taking some small actions, like you're taking... Uh, enough time to do a small amount of exercise every single day, how can you reaffirm that? How can you make yourself feel good about continuing to have that slight edge over your previous self? So I think that those are all great questions to think about when you're thinking about how can I get more consistent and how can I commit deeper to consistency in order to foster my success? And this next part that we're going to talk about is about instant everything. Now, this is the best I've ever seen this articulated. So get ready for this quote. I love this quote. So he says that through a great film, you can experience the triumph of the human soul over adversity, the drama of a struggle between doing what's right and succumbing to the temptations of the world, a moving encounter between generations, the flowering of a powerful romance, the struggle and birth of a nation. But it all has to be finished in two hours, right? All those things that could take an entire lifetime have to finish within two hours and then he goes on to say he says can you imagine a nation being born in two hours of course you can't it takes decades decades uh, meeting the person who will become the love of your life the dating courtship romance struggle triumph wedding and happy life thereafter in just two hours of course not right relationships take a very long amount of time to build so he's kind of painting this picture how everything is completely unrealistic in film and even more so now with the internet. He continues on, he says, we expect to put out the effort of a 30 second falling in love sequence and or the fighter in training sequence and get the same heroic ending in a world filled with instant coffee, instant breakfast, instant credit, instant shopping, instant information and 24 hour news. We have come dangerously close to losing touch with reality and believing that we have access to an instant life. But life is not a clickable link. Life is not a clickable link. I love that, especially now because of how much advertising is going towards click this link and, and give me your credit card and you will be successful. So again, I think that this is one of the most beautiful passages on how society is operating nowadays. Everyone wants this quick fix or this instant everything, as Jeff would say. So many people are getting rich just by selling this instant life to other people, right? Uh, click this link and take my course and you'll get rich and etc. No one's really talking about how much work it is actually going to be. And I think that's what really sets my self-coaching course apart is I'm not telling you that you're going to be able to get your life on track in six hours. I'm telling you, you're going to have to work at this every single day. I'm just going to give you a framework that's going to help you stay on track. But worse than that, is so many people are really looking for it, right? The only reason that these people are getting rich is because people are buying it and people are looking for it. And it is, you know, partly because of the things that we have been consuming throughout our lives, this movie and social media and etc., are constantly making us want things more and more instant. So, again, goals are important, and striving for success, you, you know, that you want is very important. Having that vision is definitely important. But as Brian Tracy says, determine the price you would have to pay and then get busy paying it. Goals can now help you achieve something in two hours, right? I see it quite often. People will set goals in 
then immediately they'll, you know, not immediately, but a, a week later, two weeks later, they'll think, oh, I can't believe that I haven't achieved that goal yet. And it's just like, well, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You need to determine the price that you need to pay and then get busy paying it and focus on the busy paying it part. So I think that goals are really only good. A goal and a vision is really only good as a magnet to help pull you along the line of consistency uh, that it takes to achieve them. They're not so good as a, a guidepost or something that you can potentially measure yourself against because when we do that too often, what happens is we tend to get discouraged at how far away those goals really are. Now, if you set some uh, very short-term goals, you know, month-long goals or something like that, I think that those might be a little bit more helpful. But even more helpful for that than that are what are the small, unimportant things that I can do every single day that will help me achieve what I want to achieve over my lifetime. I think that's much more important. So when you think about this life is not a clickable link concept, where are you looking for a clickable link in your life? Have you tried clickable links before and failed? So this could be, you know, courses, money making ideas, anything. It could be anything. There's a ton of different things. It really just depends on what you're interested in. There's someone selling a clickable link in that field almost for sure. So how did you feel after you tried that clickable link? Right? If you failed and you weren't able to achieve that thing, did you feel like you were a failure? Because that's what I often see happening is people will set the goal, they'll find the clickable link, and then they'll feel like you were a fail. They were a failure. But really the truth is that the failure was the plan that they tried to follow. And really it was the person who created the plan trying to make it simpler than it really is. Success can be quite complicated. Um, well, success can take quite a long time is what I should say. And life is mundane and unsexy. And this comes from Darren Hardy's The Compound Effect. He says, by the end of this book, or even before, I want you to know in your bones that your only path to success is through a continuum of mundane, unsexy, unexciting, and sometimes difficult daily disciplines, compounded over time. He says that know too that the results of your life and the lifestyle of your dreams can be yours when you put the compound effect to work for you. And that's essentially, again, the same principle as the slight edge. If you use the principles outlined in the compound effect, you will create your fairy tale ending. I think that's such a great, great quote. And of course, everyone wants the fairy tale ending. Success is a combination of those daily disciplines, as Jeff Olson would say, and as Darren Hardy would say, those things that are mundane, unsexy, and compounded over time. And what you can think about with your life being uh, mundane and unsexy, or the things in your life that are leading to success being mundane and unsexy, perhaps is a better way to put it. Where have you embraced that in your life? The mundane and unsexy. Where have you embraced doing 20 squats a day? And wh where have you embraced doing, you know, 20 push-ups a day? And just the simple things that are going to lead to you being a healthier person over time. And have you started to find success through that consistency? Rather than trying to do, you know, a thousand squats a day and a thousand push-ups a day, have you started to find success through doing something manageable, something that is mundane and unsexy. And how can you double down on that? How can you make sure that you continue to stay consistent with those things that feel mundane and unsexy, but will lead to your success in whatever endeavor you're trying to achieve? So that was instant everything, that big idea, instant everything. Very, very important. I think, again, this is playing out in today's society more than ever because of social media and the internet and the ease of access to information which in one hand is a beautiful thing and on the other hand really is ruining just the mindset that people have around what it takes to be successful. So next we're going to talk about the myth. So he says that there's a popular expression that you probably heard. Luck is preparedness meeting opportunity and that's essentially the myth. It's a handy idea but it's not quite accurate. People who live by the slight edge understand how luck really works. It's not preparedness meeting opportunity. It's not preparedness meeting opportunity. It's preparedness, period. Preparedness creates, uh, created by doing those simple, little, constructive, positive actions over and over. Luck is what happens. <laughs> Luck is when that cons consistency of preparedness eventually creates an opportunity. I'll read that again. Luck is when the that consistency of preparedness eventually creates opportunity. Consistency of preparedness eventually creates opportunity. That's essentially the truth. So one reason the slight edge is so widely ignored, unnoticed, and again, we're going back to why people aren't doing the slight edge when it seems so obvious. 
um, widely ignored, unnoticed, or and undervalued, is that our culture tends to worship the idea of the big break. We celebrate that dramatic discovery, the big breakthrough or that catapults the hero into a new place. In other words, we buy a lottery ticket. And how many times have we talked about this on this channel already through so many different books? How overnight success is just a myth. It's totally not true. And now Jeff continues on. He says, the truth of breakthroughs and lucky breaks is that yes, they do happen, but they don't happen out of thin air. They are grown like a crop. I love this quote. Really pay attention here. They are grown like a crop, planted, cultivated, and ultimately harvest. The problem is, as I mentioned the last in the last chapter, that in our cultures that in our culture <clears throat> we're trained to think that we can skip the middle and leap directly from plant to harvest. We even have a term for it. We call it the quantum leap. And it's a complete and utter myth. Complete and utter myth. So the myth, again, is essentially the overnight success, as we've explained before on this channel. And have you ever looked at someone, at someone else's success or something that someone else has achieved and thought, wow, they did that so fast. And maybe I wonder what they did, what tip or trick they followed in order to get them that success so quickly. Or maybe thought they are so lucky they got a big break or et cetera, right? But the truth is that they didn't do any one thing. They did a bunch of these little tiny things over and over and over again and most certainly they weren't lucky our society is not built upon luck very often in many different places they probably had been doing it and honing their craft for 10 years in the darkness right like uh like batman in the darkness before you e ever even found them that's the crazy part is people who are really successful they're probably been doing this for 10 years uh, malcolm gladwell talks about the 10,000 hour rule and that essentially is going to take them 10 years to accomplish what they're looking to accomplish. And they had committed to the slight edge before anyone even knew their name. And that's why you should commit to it right now. I bet if you ask almost anyone you admire, you will find that their overnight success was anything but. I totally agree with that. Overnight success is not real. And you need to try and get that out of your head as much as you possibly can and commit yourself to working the slight edge. So creating luck. Let's talk a little bit about this because I love this concept. Luck is preparedness, period. Preparedness. That's the number one thing that you need in order to get lucky. And how do you get preparedness? Preparedness is created by doing those simple, little, constructive, positive actions over and over. Seems pretty simple. And this is especially true if you want to be in a professional field. People are very people who are very successful are almost always extremely prepared and just for an example, I once read that Tony Robbins studies for three hours before a single interview. And if you know Tony Robbins, he's done a, probably a thousand interviews. And he's Tony Robbins. Why does he even need to study? He seems like he's like this all-powerful uh, self-help guru that would never have to study anything. But see, that's the fallacy that we all have. Tony Robbins had to use the slight edge to become Tony Robbins. And we all have to do the same. We have to commit to doing those mundane and boring things. The interview might be fun, but studying before the interview and knowing everything you can about the interviewer and knowing everything you can about their audience in order to provide the best possible content. Very important. You need to get over the myth of the overnight success and start creating your own luck. So the next, the next point that we're going to talk about is about Lincoln. So this is a, a very famous quote by Lincoln. He says, give me six hours to chop down a tree, goes the quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln, and I will spend the first four hours sharpening the axe, which left just two hours to do the actual chopping. And what does that essentially mean? He says that the sharper the axe, the easier the cut will be. And Jeff says, in other words, he would spend twice as much time working on the tools of the job as he would on the task itself. And in the task called your life, what are the tools of the job? He says that they are simply you. You are the axe. And no one knew better than <clears throat> no one knew that better than our sixteenth president, who poured enormous effort during his half century life into making himself into the sharpest, strongest, truest axe he possibly could. What a beautiful statement right there turning himself into the sharpest, strongest, truest axe he possibly could. Wouldn't that be a great life's goal for all of us? It's exactly what we're going to talk about in sharpening the axe. He says, 
in this task called life, you are the ax. How are you sharpening yourself? Very interesting question to ask. So these are some of the simple things that are going to make you most effective long term, and they're not heroic tack, heroic acts, right? You don't sharpen an axe through um, hitting it on a stone hard three times. You sharpen it slowly, using a wet stone, continuously, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. That's the way that you sharpen the axe. Even though the axe is very violent, right? Very violent the act of sharpening the axe is very almost meditative and continually doing the same action over and over and over again. And that's essentially how we want to live our lives. So these are simple things, right? Simple things you could do. Obviously, it'll be a little bit different for everyone, but simple things you could do are like reading a little bit each day, just 10 pages each day, watching a little bit of a video every single day on a book, getting enough sleep, putting money into savings, and just doing a little bit of exercise, right? Like I said, doing... 20 squats and 20 push-ups instead of doing 2,000 or you know even 200, depending what level of shape you're in. What are you doing every single day to sharpen the axe? It's very, very important to sharpen the axe every single day. You wouldn't uh, cut down one tree and then go and cut down another tree immediately without resharpening the axe because eventually with every hit, your axe is getting duller and duller and duller. So what are you not doing that would help? So any of these things, are you doing any of these things? And if you're not doing any of them, why aren't you doing them? And how could you get yourself to do them? And where are you tr struggling to cut down trees when you could be using a sharper ax? So this could be in a work. This could be uh, in your own personal life. How can you sharpen your skills or sharpen your daily activities, better to say, so that you can cut down the trees or overcome the problems that you face on a day-to-day -day basis? Just that little bit easier. Very important. Always good to remember that quote by Lincoln as well. It's, it seems like it's a good quote to pull out uh, at a dinner party or something like that. So always good to remember that quote. I, I really think that ingraining that quote into your life is, is a good way to go. And obviously, if you're watching this video, you are in the act of sharpening the axe. So good for you. Next, we're going to talk about course correction. And this is actually, I think if I was to pull one thing out of this book, it would be course correction. I think that it would be all about how to keep yourself on track or how you're never really on track. And we'll talk a little bit about that. It might have sounded confusing, but we'll talk a little bit about that. So the quote goes like this. He says, on the way to, the, to landing astronauts safely on the surface of the moon, the miracle, miracle of modern engineering that was the Apollo rocket was actually on course for only 2 to 3% of the time. This is amazing to me. Which means that for at least 97% of the time, it took to get from Earth to the moon, it was off course. In a journey of nearly a quarter of a million miles, the vehicle was actually on track for only 7,500 miles. Or, to put it another way, for every half hour the ship was in flight, it was on course for less than one minute. Wow, half hour only on course for one minute. It, and it take to re that it took to reach the moon safely and returned to tell the tale. Even though it was off track so much, it returned to tell the tale. It actually went to the moon safely and returned to tell the tale. Pretty amazing. So how was such a thing possible? Because modern space travel is a masterful experience of slight edge course correction. That's exactly what we're going to talk about, slight edge course correction. If this machine, which is at the time one of the most sophisticated, expensive, and finely calibrated pieces of technology ever devised, was correcting its own off course errors 29 minutes out of every 30 is it reasonable to expect that you could do any better so essentially what he's saying is if you have a goal you have a magnet that's pulling you towards it because you've set your vision if you get off track it's completely normal because even the Apollo rocket was off course 29 minutes out of every 30 and he continues to go on he says let's say you were just able to match the Apollo rockets degree of accuracy in the pursuit of your own goals that would mean that you you'd perfect, be perfectly on target and on course no more than 10 days in a given year. Isn't that amazing to think about? The next time you're giving yourself a hard time because you feel like you've gotten off track, think about the Apollo program and give yourself a break. And isn't that so true? We often feel like we're off track. And as Jeff illustrates in the Apollo rocket analogy, we are almost never really on track, yet we always beat ourselves up when we feel like we've gotten off track, when we missed a day of exercise, when we missed a day of healthy eating, when we missed a day of doing some 
business activities that we think will lead us towards our success in business, we continually beat ourselves up. And I know I definitely sometimes fall prey to this as well. Also, we often don't just look, oh, this is a really good point. Also, we often don't just look at the small changes we need to, to make the course correction, right? So if we were just a, you know 10% off, we don't look at the 10% we need to make to get ourselves back on course. Instead, we look at the massive amount of work that we have ahead of us. Exactly right. Instead of 10%, we're looking at 100, 200, or a few thousand percent of things that we need to do. And this often causes us to give up on the things that we desire because of the perception of them being so far away. We can't seem to just stay on track, even though, like we said here, we never really are on track 10 days a year. If you can match what the Apollo missions could do, and I mean, they have some of the smartest people in the entire world working on this. Thus, it's leading us to never really accomplishing anything. We can't seem to stay on track, and it causes us to give up. But if you look at it as, oh, we're never really on track, and it's really kind of a balancing act between getting yourself um, closer towards the line that would be your um, specific slight edge and then further away and you kind of are going through this ebb and flow in order to create this perceived straight line which is um, which is up here that we talked about I believe sorry but we're looking for essentially the uh, yes this graph I apologize about that, but this graph isn't really as beautiful a straight line as it seems here, right? One day you might improve 2%, the next day you might improve 0%, and the day after that you might improve negative 1%. So you can see that it really is an up and down, jagged line towards compounding success. That's essentially what this course correction model is talking about, this idea, this concept of course correction. And a few of the questions that you could ask yourself is, what is your moon landing? Everyone involved in the Apollo space missions knew what their end destination was, the moon. And because they were so intently focused on landing on landing there, they didn't focus much on being off course. And instead, they course corrected just enough to get them back on track for a moment. And then they almost immediately got off track again, right? You have to keep that in mind. Instead, they course corrected just enough to get them back on track for a moment. But then immediately, right away, after one minute, they were off track again, to which they responded by resolving that they didn't really want to go to the moon anyways, right? As soon as they got off track, they did this. They said, ah, I can't. We can't seem to stay on track that what we projected for the moon. We may as well just quit now, right? So that is how we actually ended up never going to the moon. It's pretty amazing how they failed the Apollo missions. Now, obviously, that's not the truth. What they actually did was they just got back on track again. And every time they failed, they just continued to get back on track and continued to back, get back on track. And we all know the story. They landed on the moon and then they came right back. Because they kept the goal the goal and focused instead on consistently course correcting. They didn't focus on how far away they were from the goal. They focused on their course and they continued to course correct towards that goal until eventually they achieved what they were going out to achieve. And this concept, course correction concept, actually goes perfectly with planning not to plan. I love this. I love this point. This is essentially how I live my whole entire life. Loosely, right? So the quote goes like this. It says that this is the point where people are often thrown off track. It's easy to assume that you need to put, to pl to put together a, the plan that will get you there. In other words, the right plan, the plan that will work, no. Right, so essentially what he's saying here, uh, the con the syntax looks a little wrong. I might have typed it in wrong, but essentially what he's saying is we assume that we need to create this plan that's going to get us exactly to where we want to go, step by step by step by step, and we assume that nothing will change along the way. So essentially what he's saying here is it's not even good to come up with a plan. He says start a plan, get a plan that's going to get you started, and I love that part. We'll continue on here. Hopefully the syntax corrects itself. So he continues and he says, uh, the point is not to come up with a brilliant blueprint that is guaranteed to take you all the way to success. The point is simply to come up with a plan that will get you out of the starting gate. It's not even that your starting plan doesn't necessarily get you there. It's for sure won't get you there, right? You're absolutely, undoubtedly, 100% not going to get there with a plan that you originally created. 
at least not the exact plan that you conceived at first, right? You'll have to make those tiny course corrections along the way, even if you do have the world's most perfect plan. He continues to say that nobody has that degree of perfection, precision, in long term in long range planning. And there are too many variables and the surprises along the way that will require adjustments to the plan. You have to start with a plan, but the plan that you start with will not be the plan that gets you there. In fact, just for emphasis, I'm going to say once more, you will have to start with a plan. Have to start with a plan. Just a plan that will get you started. But the plan you start with will not be the plan that gets you there. So I want to talk about this. Even the best plans fail. As Jeff says here, we often think that we need to plan something from start to finish. It's just simply not the truth. Whether it's a workout plan, exactly the workout plans you're going to follow until you lose X amount of pounds, diet plans, the same thing, financial plans, I'm going to save exactly the same amount until I finally achieve the goal that I achieved, or business plans, for sure business plans. I don't know how many business plans I've written over the last 10 years that didn't turn out to be anything like what I thought they were going to be. Uh, Well, it might be a good exercise, right? It's a good exercise in some disciplines, for sure, to write out some of these plans. It's assured that your first plan will fail. So why not just plan to do something that will get you to the starting line? Now, I said this, and I do think it's important to have a plan that will potentially lead you to what your success is. But I also think that what ends up happening is people will spend far more time in the planning stage than is necessary. And the bigger the plan gets, the less likely they are to start something. So I think that you should start with a small plan that's going to get you some beta testing and just get going. That's how it should work. I think that's the way that you should get going on any one of these things. Start with, oh, I'll, I'll try this workout plan today and see how it goes. And same with the diet and financial plan and business plans. Start something now, immediately. So again, this question is, how can you start? This is the most important part of the plan. I think about it. I think it's the most important part anyways. Think about how you can get started. So a quick side note. Once you get started, you start to build momentum. Ooh, the big word of momentum. Before, before that, it seems incredibly hard to start. And building a big plan will make starting that much more difficult. Exactly like I said before, building a big plan will make the actual starting of the thing much more difficult. Because now instead of just one small thing to get you going, you've created this big massive plan in your head. And plus when you do that, you often tie up your ego into that plan. So if it fails, that plan fails, it ends up being that we fail because we have our ego tied up into this big uh, miraculous plan that we've come up with. And we get discouraged and, and quit. Can you see that there's a bunch of different things that are just going to lead us to quit? And if we could find a way to get around those things, uh, it would eventually lead to success. So if you ask the question, how can, how can I start? What's the one small thing you can do right now to get going? This works especially well in business. It works very well with health and fitness. And obviously it works with reading books as well. Can I read the first chapter? Go ahead and give that a try. Now, the next concept that we're going to talk about is this concept of no one watching. What do you do when no one is watching? So the quote goes like this, says, There are many definitions of integrity, honesty, truthfulness, congruence between words and deeds. The aspect of integrity that is most applicable to the slight edge is what you do when no one is watching. And isn't that the time that self-discipline is the most important? He continues to say that, It's in that moment's decision when nobody else is watching and no one will ever know when your choice is so slight, so subtle, so insignificant. It's at that moment that you find out whether or not you have slight edge integrity, right? When no one's watching, no one will even know. It's such a small thing, so subtle, so insignificant that you're the only person that will know whether you actually did it or not. So thinking of this, when no one's watching, what do you do? There will be certain times in your career, your health, your finances, that you'll have to do small, mundane, and unsexy daily disciplines. Those same things that we've been talking about this whole entire book when no one is watching. Meaning that there is going to be no social reward or any potential social pain because of not doing the task or for completing the task if you get the reward. And what do you do then? That's what really matters. Can you work out on your own? Can you save money on your own? Can you work on your business on your own? right? When no one's watching, that's the important part. And can you hold yourself accountable? And that's really the essence of self-discipline. And Brian Tracy says this about self-discipline, the ability to discipline yourself to delay gratification in the short term in order to enjoy greater rewards in the long term is the indispensable prerequisite for success. It's the indispensable 
prerequisite for success. So in order to cultivate the slight edge, you need to cultivate self-discipline, the skill of self-discipline, and continue to practice the slight edge and practice the mentality and the principles and the actions of the slight edge when no one is watching. Now the final point here that I wanted to make was the seven habits. And this is essentially the seven habits of the slight edge. And this is quite a long quote, but we're going to go through it. We're going to say, you may think that I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. You are capable of great things. I know this because I've observed the human condition. And every soul alive is capable of great things. Most will never achieve them or experience them, but anyone can if they only understand how the process works. Very interesting. And these are the seven habits, essentially. We're going to go through them next. Habit number one is show up. You have to start by showing up. Habit number two is to show up consistently. You have to show up every single day. Or at the very least, don't miss two days in a row, like James Clear says in Atomic Habits. And then he says, show up consistently with a positive outlook, right? So if you're showing up and you're showing up consistently, but you're showing up with a negative outlook and not giving your best to whatever small things that you need to get done, you're never going to actually achieve success because you're not going to be able to show up consistently for very long and you're not going to be able to give enough in order to actually deserve the success that you desire. He says, be prepared for and committed to the long haul. So whenever you're setting goals, I like to set visions. I like to set visions in 10, 20, 25 years, lifetime goals, lifetime visions, as opposed to setting, you know, even one year goals or, or one month goals or something short like that. And then you have to be willing to pay the price. If you want a certain amount of success, there's going to be a certain amount of uh, price that you have to pay and extra work or extra money or any of those things. So if you want to be successful in anything, you have to be willing to pay the price and make sure that you're willing to pay the price before you start it on the journey or else you'll get halfway through and you'll realize that you're not willing to actually pay the price. And do the things that you've committed to doing, right? You've committed to doing certain things in order to be successful, even when no one is watching. So again, we talked about no one watching. You have to make sure that you're willing to be committed to those things, even when no one is watching. And now we'll talk about mastering the habits, and this is the final point here on our mind map. This quote is from the chapter, chapter where Jeff shows us the seven habits of highly effective slight edge masters. And you can see that that was obviously borrowed from seven habits of highly effective people. Each one is a specific habit that you'll need to practice in order to achieve the slight edge that we've been talking about. Keep in mind, Keep them in mind. I, I think that you could write these You could write these down on your computer desk. You could post them up on the wall beside you. And you can think, am I showing up? Am I showing up consistently? Am I showing up with that positive outlook? Am I prepared and committed to the long haul? Have I cultivated that burning desire backed by faith? Have I created that amazing vision for my life? And am I willing to pay the price? And of course, what am I doing when no one is watching? Keep them in mind and continue along the path of consistency. So that was The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. I was very happy to have you guys here today. I'll leave some links down below to some of the other books that I mentioned in this video. And if you're looking forward to the next one, I will see you then. Thanks.